Hello, thank you for joining us today for the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, How to Incorporate Controls into HVAC Systems, sponsored by ABB. I'm your host, Amara Rasgis with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology, and I'll be with you today for this hour-long session. First, let's learn about this webcast platform. If you're having trouble with your slides or the audio, please refresh your internet browser or click on the refresh media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume settings by adjusting the volume on your own computer. If you're having technical problems, click on the question marks at the top right corner of your screen to do some system checks before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message into the ask a question box and we will respond in the answered questions box. To download the presentation slides, use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. Please type messages for today's presenters in the ask a question box on the left side of your screen. You may ask questions at any time during this presentation and the interactive Q&A will begin in about 45 minutes. If you're interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab at the top of your screen. The quiz opens up in a new browser window, so I recommend you open that tab right now because it will close when this webcast signs off. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system policy, please take a moment to read this quality assurance slide. Here are the learning objectives. We'll talk about these in today's presentation. Please note that any red underlined text is a hyperlink within the PDF where you can get some more information. Let's now hear from today's sponsor. At the conclusion of the commercial, you may experience a few seconds of silence to make up for different internet speeds. Please stay tuned after this presentation for the rest of the broadcast. All right, very nice. Thank you so much for that support. We've lined up two really knowledgeable presenters today. Mike Click is the Managing Principal of Affiliated Engineers National Commissioning Practice. With expertise honed over 20 years, he remains on the cutting edge of the commi uh, commissioning industry by observing a flexible framework to define a custom commissioning process. Mike uh, has served as a project manager and commissioning engineer for many large and technically complex buildings, including academic, laboratory, healthcare, data center, uh, central utility, and office facilities. Jason Gerke has about 20 years of mechanical design, commissioning, and project management experience. He has designed mechanical systems for a variety of projects, including industrial, commercial, education, and resort entertainment facilities. 
This commissioning experience includes a whole host of project types. Jason also serves as a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. All right, well, I am very eager to get started on this discussion, but first we want to ask you for some audience input so we know what direction to take. Here's our first poll question. If you would please take this poll, the question is who on your team specifies or designs control systems in your building projects. So let's take a look here to see what the responses are. Um, again, we're just looking for a little bit of background information so we know better exactly who we're speaking to and what we should focus on today. So let's take a look here. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, this is almost a landslide. Mechanical engineer is the number one response uh, number two response is controls expert or engineer, but it is essentially mechanical engineer by a landslide. So with that, Mike, I'm going to turn over this presentation to you. Hey, thanks, Amara. I appreciate it. Uh, great to be here today. Um, hey, everyone. In order to assess controls for design, we thought it would be important just to quickly understand the origin and background of how far we've come in the controls industry. Um, pneumatics were one of the first original control systems that were that was out there. Pneumatic control systems operate by compressing air, which is then dried and sent down a piping called main lines. At the most basic level, the pressurized air from the main line will move through a sensing device like a thermostat. That thermostat would then allow a certain amount of pressure out of its branch lines to control the operation. This air would act as control signal to a device like an actuator, it would regulate the amount of mainline air that is entering the actuator. This is how the actuator is controlled. So some of you, uh, maybe many of you, have been in a classroom sometime in the past and you've adjusted a thermostat and you felt that air come out of the thermostat and you're going, what's going on with that? That is a pneumatic system. Um, and that was the most basic form of controls back in the day. As we moved through time, we started to find ways to improve the process and gradually away from the inefficiencies of pneumatics um, and moved into electronic control and direct digital control. Today, controls technicians and facility operators can now make changes to control sequences simply by changing the software code. They no longer had to rewire circuits or relays in the field. They were simply able to log in and make those program changes. So a deeper look into building automation architecture, something we may not talk enough about in the industry, um, but it, it's worth a chat. So there are really four layers to any modern building automation system architecture. There's your server application level, uh, and that's right there where you see the server and the workstation tied into the switch. Then you have your supervisory layer, which is the very next layer below it called supervisory control. Your field control layer, which is the equipment controllers you see down there on the bottom tied to the, the bus, and then your input output layer, which is basically your IO. So let's go through those real quick. The server or application layer looks to consolidate data from multiple different supervisory devices. That means your server application layer is really looking at multiple devices, maybe in different buildings across your campus and tying them all back into a GUI or a graphical user interface. The server will also sort trend, alarm, and schedule data in a database. This database can be used for reporting back to the owner. The supervisory layer are kind of like your home router. They collect all the traffic from the field controllers and consolidate this traffic. These devices serve to manage your communication trunk. Your communication trunk allows your field controllers to connect to one another and allow your supervisory devices to collect information from the field controllers. Some supervisory devices can act as a user interface, similar to what your server level application does. Typical features that exist in the supervisory device are user interfaces, trends, scheduling, and alarming, global logic, and communication trunk management. Field controllers look at data from inputs, like temperature sensors, temperature transmitters, pressure transmitters, and then collect control outputs and send outputs to actuators, relays, pumps, fans, dampers. BAS companies will program tool, use programming tools to program these field controllers. 
these controllers programs will look at what the inputs are doing and then they will control the outputs. The final piece of the puzzle is the input and output layer, as you see down there at the bottom. That's really your IO in the field, input, output. Um, those are your devices that are making decisions and making the operations go in the right direction. So those would be devices such as pressure transmitters inputting information into the equipment controller, it making a process, deciding, making decisions, and then sending an output signal to a pump or a fan. Quick example of that. The next slide is something that we see quite a bit in the industry um, where you have one protocol bus but then you also have another protocol bus tied into it. So again, you see the same application layers that we talked about earlier. The server application layer is at the top where you see the server, the laptops, or workstation. Those laptops and workstations are usually local to the building. The server can be cloud, in the cloud, and accessed anywhere remotely. But on that same um, supervisory layer, you see down there under supervisory controller, then you have your equipment controllers. A lot of times in a lot of our projects, we see electrical equipment tied into the BACnet bus through Modbus. So it's not uncommon to see two protocols operating one control system. This is kind of what it really looks like out there in the field. Now you've probably got a better visual of what's going on. So you have your operator work workstation up there at the top, and that can be a laptop, that could be a server rack, or that could even be um, a desktop. And then your, your next layer below that would be your automation servers. You see those there, and then tying into your equipment level controllers, and then out to your IO, your valves, your actuators, those things in the field. As we were putting together this presentation, there was quite a discussion about proprietary versus open protocol, which continues to perpetuate our industry. Um, and I, I put a couple of graphics here. Some of you may have seen these before. Um, but that's kind of a visual of what it looks like. Uh, on your left is someone using an open protocol who can tie into multiple different platforms. And then there on your right, you see a gentleman who's trying to control multiple different control platforms with one with different GUIs and different operating systems. So that's a big challenge. Let's dive into what these are and what they mean. We don't see proprietary systems very often much anymore, at least in my industry. Um, proprietary systems are only licensed to one vendor. So, you know, imagine taking your car to only one car dealership and having it worked on. You got to hope that that car dealership is, is, is a good car, car dealership and can do good work. If they don't, um, you're kind of stuck with that car until you get a new one. That's how controls work too for proprietary systems. I'm sure there's a place for these, but when you're trying to operate various different buildings on a campus level or even on a commercial level, proprietary systems not, might not be the one you wanna select. Unfortunately, once you select a proprietary system, you're locked into that controller and regardless of how good that business is doing or whether it goes out of business, um, you're kind of locked in or you have to make those changes. So I would suggest that diversity in maintenance and operations is key. So now taking a look at your open protocols, there are really four main open protocols that are used in the industry. BACnet by far the most utilized I've seen. Modbus is also used in combination with BACnet or others to incorporate electrical equipment and that's found all across campuses. LAN is very similar to BACnet, also considered open, but we don't see those quite as much as BACnet and there are some, some um, things that it doesn't do as well as BACnet. Then there's also the N2 protocols designed by a controls vendor. It's not used very much. In order to confuse things a little more, this controls vendor also has a proprietary N2 protocol. So both N2 protocol and Modbus have proprietary software. Modbus, if you specify it, make sure you specify the open version of Modbus. If you specify N2, which we don't see very often, again, make sure you specify the open version of N2 protocol. What some of the advantages the BACnet has, um, it communicates across multiple subnets. 
creates multi-campus control systems for you campus operators out there. It utilizes the benefits of fiber and giga ethernet, and it assigns IP addresses to our devices, making them web accessible. Just looking inside a little bit on the protocol's inner workings, we won't spend a whole lot of time on this, um, but it's worth noting that the protocol's inner workings does operate on the OSI, or the Open System Interconnection Module. Um, goals that are included with this are the ability to communicate directly with peer devices on their network. They should also be able to use local broadcast received by all peer devices on their network. They should be able to send remote broadcasts to devices residing on networks within different network numbers. And global broadcasting should still work as it does today. This kind of brings everything together in the background of the open protocols. So welcome to the acronym filled wasteland known as building automation or controls. You may be wondering what do we use and when do we use it? We did have a few questions about that as we were preparing this presentation. What we are calling BAS often goes by many, many different names. And there are a few here, but I'd like to walk through these and just discuss some of the differences that you might find. So in my mind, and maybe Jason's too, building automation system is the preferred name. The word automation infers that there are microprocessors doing real-time control. Building management system is sometimes used by software companies that are selling work order type systems or our graphical interface, but do not include any real-time control. And what that means is these building management systems will sit on top of a building automation system and then do other work that you're trying to find out about how those controls are working. But you still have to have the guts of the building automation system there working together. Building automation and control system is really just an expanded version of BAS. So they really mean the same thing. Energy management system has been adopted by the software makers like IBM, GE, I think Hitachi and Siemens has one. There's a bunch of them out there who wants to collect all sorts of energy usage and costs and try to lower or save energy costs. For this type of system, there may or may not be a control component so again, this system would sit on top of what we would describe as a building automation system. Direct digital controls used a lot. Um, although to me, it's really a controller versus a solid state or pneumatic controller. In other words, direct digital controls network together and make up a building automation system. There are features that are used in building automation systems that are specific to the graphical interface. that are not part of the direct digital control it is not an important distinction, but it helps everyone keep communicating in the right direction. Thought it was kind of important just to really understand the, the communication on the IO level. We talked about this earlier, that layer, the IO layer, um, the input output layer. This is where you're looking at your instrumentation in the field. While we dive into this, it's important to understand and I hope everybody remembers this from this pre presentation, that every control system follows a specific pattern. Input, then there's a process, and then there's an output driven. In a control system, an input device starts a status or feedback signal to a controller. Today, we are dealing with analog or digital inputs from the field sensors and devices. From here, the controller will drive an output to perform a task. It would be something as simple as turning a fan on when a wall switch is flipped, and that is a digital input. Or it could be as complex as controlling a wall of individual regulated fans based on the average of several different pressure transmitters. That would be an, an analog operation. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. It all follows the same process and pattern of input, process, output. So as you look, analog systems and digital systems are, are fairly different. And some key words to, to, to keep in mind, pressure transmitter would be an analog input. An analog output would be some, a signal that you're sending across a range to maybe a fan to modulate that fan or damper or valve. A digital input is discrete. So pressure switch would describe a digital. Anything with switch at the end of it 
would typically be a digital input or flow switch or pressure switch. A digital output would just be sort of on or off. That is something that you've signaled to say, hey, this is either a one or a zero on or off. I think those are important things. Uh, a lot of times people miss that, so. Um. All right, so thank you, Mike. We're going to ask another question here. Um, so this poll is, how do you integrate control systems into design documents? So this is looking a little bit more at documentation and will take us to the next portion of our presentation. So if you could take a moment to answer that one for me, we'll see if this one is a landslide again. And it is a landslide, all right. Most of you have answered both. You use both specifications and PNID, process and instrumentation diagrams. So thank you very much for responding to that. And we're going to move on. Jason, you are up. Thank you, Amara. So we're gonna move on and talk about early design considerations. So as we go through this, we wanna, we wanna consider the needs of a facility related to the building automation system. There are some early design considerations and actions that will start the process off on the correct foot. So consideration of the system hierarchy, including the system architecture that Mike just talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, you need to consider preparing a whole building diagram and identifying control elements. You should consider how the building automation system, uh, the network architecture will coordinate with building electrical and other building IT systems. Uh, we need to consider how the automation system will affect other design disciplines and building systems. Um, and you should begin a conversation with the owner to start documenting their needs, wants, and dreams for the building automation system, uh, both related to your area of responsibility, which might be HVAC, and how other systems may be affected. A lot of times as the uh, HVAC or mechanical person on a project, you're the one getting those conversations going. So our next uh, slide here is on design approach. So how do we implement control sequences in, in the construction documents? Um, getting into some specific steps when preparing the construction documents and specifying building automation systems here. Um, the approach is based on, on a building automation system for this example. Uh, the design process uh, roughly could follow this order of events. This is not all encompassing, but in general, um, someone might identify the appropriate HVAC system for the building. This could be a quick decision or a long process um, of analysis and consideration. Uh, next, you wanna start identifying the HVAC system equipment. Um, and once that's complete, you can start identifying options for system control. So this could be local controls, uh, non-networked, or building-wide connected. So then you wanna begin the process of identifying opportunities for integration of multiple systems into a building system. So as we start documenting the building automation system, um, the specifications are what really tells that story. Um, after these early steps that I just talked about are completed, the next step is really preparing this actual specification. Uh, there are several common methods to use when specifying an automation system. Uh, these are maybe common to some and unheard of by others. Uh, it really depends on what uh, markets you're in and clients you're serving. So we just wanted to go through a few examples here. Um, a designer might be using specifications that are included in a plan set. This could be commonly referred to as sheet specs. This is a typical approach for like commercial projects, maybe retail buildings. Uh, these specifications may not be highly detailed uh, related to controls, but they might only list equipment to be controlled and just state generic outcomes. Again, this conversation is focused on, on the controls part of it. However, people decide to use their sheet specs. Um, another step up from this outline format is uh, to prepare performance-based specifications for the building automation system. Uh, these specifications uh, might be on a plan sheet, but are more commonly in a specification booklet. Um, the, this uh, specification format for controls will describe the uh, sequence of operations, uh, sequence of operations, I'm sorry, um, will reference equipment types and define the required outcomes. 
So the next level above the performance based is a detailed sequence of operations. This would be more sophisticated. Uh, and this would identify specific equipment designations and labeling of control devices as it uh, describes what is happening when. Uh, this type of detail provides a very specific sequence uh, for each piece of equipment in the HVAC system, continuing the HVAC system as the example here. Um, next, uh, Mike, I wanted to uh, cue you up here to maybe talk real quick about uh, points lists and how that might be prepared. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, sure. So, you know, a lot of times on, on our design documents, we will list a points list. I think you actually show one there on your graphic, um, but it's very important to have one of those so that you can show the analogs inputs, the analog outputs that you're expecting for your project, the digital inputs and the digital outputs. Along with that, you can also identify alarming systems, alarming for particular points that aren't working correctly. It just gives a graphical user interface for a controls contractor to then work from and, and make some decisions in the field when they're, when they're making the, those programming changes. Okay, thanks, Thank Mike. Another, um, another option here is to prepare control diagrams. Um, personally, I see this as a, a common approach um, on certain types of projects uh, by some consultants. Um, so an example here, um, in this diagram, uh, a little bit busy, but uh, very simplistic things uh, for fan control, dampers, uh, things like that. This uh, may be developed further into a p and arrangement where wiring is shown from uh, control devices to equipment that is controlled. Um, but it's another opportunity uh, to graphically show uh, control devices. As we all know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, so just wanted to go through those options. The next thing we're gonna talk about is just a really quick example here. Uh, we've, we've given some examples along the way, but just to kind of call out something specific here, um, the approach would be, or the, the system would be a single zone air handling unit. Uh, that's gonna depend on a lot of things. We're engineers, so the answer is it depends. Um, the, uh, you know, you might look at a single zone air handling unit. Well, it depends on what kind of building it is in. So if we said it's in a light commercial building, the appropriate control specification would probably be an outline spec on a plan sheet. That's probably good enough for that application. It'll get the point across. There's nothing too sophisticated about that. Um, now, another approach, and which I would say is a very common approach for many designers, is to use the performance specification format in a spec book. Um, this would allow us to put thought into the control requirements and ensure that they meet the project requirements, but it's not detailed to every piece of equipment as far as the designations, and it doesn't require the amount of time to be spent compared to uh, some of the other options. Uh, those options uh, continue to be a points list, so we can show um, analog and digital inputs and outputs um, to tell the, the clear story of what's happening, or if, it, if the implementation of a control diagram, whether it's P&ID type, or maybe like the example here showing um, general lines uh, indicating airflow through an air handling unit system. So the next thing we wanna to touch on uh, related to design approach is code standards and guidelines. Um, there are many resources available to provide guidance on specification of a control system. These um, can be divided up into these uh, kind of three main categories. And you can see a list of some of the uh, possible resources here. Um, next, we wanna talk about how to decide which of these is more important, a code, a standard, or a guideline. So each of these will have a different priority depending on the project type, the client, uh, who you are, uh, what your um, deliverables are required on the project. So it's important that the design professional identify the project requirements early in the design phase, as we discussed earlier. As then as the project requirements are identified or owner requirements for standards to follow are identified, um, you can start using either the, these uh, well-documented examples that were on the previous page um, or identify the owner's standards, which might not be public, um, but still well-documented. Um, or an owner may say we need to um, that we need to meet some specific insurance requirements. So there could be things related to organizations like FM Global or other insurance companies uh, need to be met on a project. And while these requirements are very often related to system level 
uh, things. They can also affect the control sequences, uh, the control specifications on a project. So it's important that you review them, look at them from not just an equipment standpoint, but also a control standpoint. Um, and as we continue to try to figure out what are we following, a code, a standard, or a guideline, um, we should be aware that sometimes codes can be used as a reference, even if they're not adopted in a local municipality. There could be newer versions of a code that, that could be referenced, and a lot of times that's a, uh, an acceptable process with code officials. Um, or there might be uh, codes like, uh, in, my, uh, in my case, we don't have to follow the international fire code uh, very often. Uh, for was projects in Wisconsin, but many um, clients may want to follow that for their own uh, their own requirements. Um, maybe their insurance company is telling them to do it, or maybe it's just their own requirements to follow it. Uh, there's other agencies that may require certain guidelines to be followed, and these would be minimum project requirements. So again, it's uh, it doesn't matter if it's a code, a standard, or a guideline. It's really what is the project requirement. So government agencies may require certain things. So this could be the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example, and their UFC standards, um, GSA has their own things or, or other government agencies. Um, of course, consideration needs to be given to achieving uh, the industry standard of care as well. So a solid resource uh, to achieve this as well as a great resource for how to do things are ASHRAE guidelines and handbooks, um, which some are written in a way that uh, that are codified and they're able to be used in that way. So it's important that when you're doing a code review for a project, you're you're obviously do that's the you get that part out of the way, but you also need to identify what are these standards or guidelines that also might be required. <clears throat> so the next uh, conversation here is going to be about how we implement control sequences in construction documents. So once the specifying engineer identifies a system other items need to be considered as well as these requirements are implemented. So I think for the first one here, Mike, if you wanna to touch on cybersecurity. Yeah, Jason, thanks. So, you know, given this a lot of thought, I'm not a cybersecurity guy necessarily. I do know, understand a little bit around um, what happens in control systems. What I'd like to share with you is a hundred, there's nothing that's a hundred percent secure out there. I'm sorry, that's just the truth. Anything can be hacked given enough time, money, and skill. What I will leave you with is there are two common areas of focus for cybersecurity for your building automation system to consider. One would be confidentiality, minimizing visibility, closing open points of access. And what I mean by that is making sure that you minimize what's on your network, make sure those ports on your network are closed, Port 80 being the internet network, the HTTP port, make sure that's closed. You don't need to be reaching out to various other things and, and document what ports you do have open. The next one would be integrity of the system, validating devices, users, and applications. So making sure that all of the information that you're putting on that BAS network is validated. And that includes the people that are operating and signing in with passwords to that network. Um, so, so those are just a, two things that I, I leave you with and I'll let you get back to it, Jason, thanks. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, so for these other, these other four bullet points on the page, um, it could be a series of questions as you're uh, implementing these things. So um, how is energy use affected by the control system? Let's think about that. Um, are operations made easier, more difficult by the building operation system? This would be related to um, actual building operator use. Um, is there a need for uh, continuous uh, commissioning, either of a human form or automatic fault detection? Um, and then is there a need for flexibility in the future? This could be related to building modifications, um, implementation of new control sequences, a part of continuous improvement process, or simply adding more parts and pieces uh, to the system because maybe it wasn't all affordable on day one. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of opportunities here and lots of things to be considered. Every project is gonna have a different requirement, a different approach will be um, appropriate in different situations. All right, so the next uh, conversation is gonna be about system integration. So as we're thinking about a building automation system, uh, they're capable of controlling many aspects of a building. So an automation system could control only the HVAC or it could control only the lighting system. 
in those examples, either of those systems are happy on their own with local controls and not on a building-wide network, or they're happy on a building-wide network. Either way, those are simple, simple systems, or, or can be simple systems. Uh, there are many building systems to consider for integration into a building-wide automation system uh, beyond just those. So each of these systems come with a monetary cost, and pros and cons related to operations. Uh, it's important to weigh owner requests with what is possible and how much the implementation will cost. I've worked on many projects and I'm sure many of you have as well, where there are big dreams at the beginning of the design and only to have those dreams evaporate as uh, construction costs are applied uh, to a project. Um, as each of these possible system uh, integrations are evaluated, make sure you understand what the, uh, the client is requesting. Is it a want or is it a need for the project? Uh, because the client obviously has input during this process, but you need to help guide and lead that process as well and make sure that you're standing up for what is necessary if it does come down to a cost situation and things um, get are you know things are trying to be cut uh, in this list here is just a sample um, of some systems with opportunities there's other systems that could be integrated as well uh, another <clears throat> conversation here is the control system capabilities so as the decision on which control systems should be integrated into a, a single building-wide automation system, um, you, want to, uh, you want to ensure that consideration is given uh, to the capability of the control system. So this slide lists a few operating characteristics to consider uh, when you're specifying the building automation system. It's important that the uh, specifying engineer consider uh, what the building automation system needs to provide for information and feedback during operation of the building. So specifically for HVAC controls, the, these capabilities uh, could be considered. So load shifting, is there a need to, um, uh, is there a, a need to shift production of heating and cooling? Uh, load shedding, is there a need to automatically reduce building load? Could have uh, different monitoring capabilities, trending capabilities, alarming, and then uh, fault detection. Is there an expectation that the control system uh, will identify things automatically? So if these things aren't properly specified, the final, consist, uh, the final system configuration may not meet your, your expe expectations of the client's requirements. So when it comes to efficiency and control systems, um, the energy consumption of the buildings is directly affected by the successful implementation of the control system. Um, the building automation system. So this is going to affect it throughout the life of the building. A few important points to consider for um, building automation system related to uh, energy use. And these are things to think about. So do the control sequences consider all equipment connected and affected by the system? Are the control sequences holistic? Are the um, specified control systems reliable? Are they, um, are they common typically? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, are they common? Are they uh, typical, readily available? Um, is the control equipment capable or able to achieve the sequences? That's also important uh, that you're writing sequences and coupling it up with the equipment that can do it. And then is the logic able to be modified um, for the specific project requirements? Um, and then another important point here is operations. So the, when it's related to control sequences, are they complete and have they been tested? So this is where commissioning is important. Are the control components available uh, ongoing? Um, how about control? How about servicing that control equipment? Um, can you get to the panels? Are they in accessible locations? What happens to the actual operating equipment when these controls are uh, worked on? And then, as far as the control logic goes, uh, is it complete and tested on day one? And then, are there options? And then, this gets into the conversation about pr uh, proprietary situations. Um, and is it acceptable or is an open system required? So at this point, Mike, I'm gonna let you take it. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, just getting back to the differences in some of what we've been seeing in the industry as far as design documents go and, and how people are laying out controls in their design documents, it's worth understanding probably the three most popular forms of controls, sequences of operation. Um, the first one is more industrial process related SAMA drawings or Scientific Apparatus Markers Association. These SAMA drawings really just detail out a lot of the control in a graphical sense. 
Um, the pro is best design layout for programming. The con is sometimes difficult to understand, which is unfortunate because this is really what the functional block diagrams look like when the controls contractor puts information in a lot of times. Um, what we see mainly is the written control sequences um, that, that designers put out. So easy to understand. Um, but the con is the interpretation and logic to develop the paragraph that you've written tends to be difficult to program, especially just like the paragraph. So there's some liberties usually being taken there, which is okay. You've got to get the controls going in the right direction. And then there's the opportunity to, to do both. So that's a little bit more design intensive. Um, it's easy to program and easy to understand from a controls contractor perspective, but the con is it's costly to incorporate and takes a lot of high level design. But I thought it was worth at least talking about those three. Um, briefly, I wanted to touch on this and I don't think a lot of people understand where some of our nomenclature came from for our controls devices. So I, I, I wanted to go back and just discuss the International Society of Automation or ISA. So it, they have a great standard in there that discuss how to tag specific field or IO pieces of equipment. It's worth taking a look at that and, and diving into it a little bit more when you get the chance. This is also part of the ISA standard. Um, it's, it's, again, it's worth diving into that a little bit more. This will help you understand what some of the symbols are in the field if they're not documented on the design documents. And it'll help you also become more standardized with your design do documents across the industry, which will make us all stronger and better at what we're doing in our day-to-day in, in -day jobs. This example just shows sort of how you can determine um, what the controls are doing uh, in the field just by the PNIDs. Um, so once you've digested that ISA standard, you'd understand that that's a process controller, PC. The ZC is a position controller. Um, so just by looking at this diagram, you can already determine what is going to happen and how it's gonna happen. In these examples, so I take so take some time to look these over after you've reviewed the ISA standard and see if you can determine what these are doing in the field. This was just a quick example of networking VFDs. Um, I, I know a lot of these are now IP related, BACnet VFDs, and not MSTP. So the difference between MSTP is a serial connection RS four eighty five, IP is through an Ethernet. But what we're trying to show you here is that these are controllers, VFDs are controllers, and they're all networked together with your system level controller. So that can happen. And there's controls within those VFDs that we need to pay attention to so that we're making sure those are programmed correctly as far as ramp rates and how things are determined. There was a little bit of discussion about cybersecurity and I wanted to touch on a couple of different architectures that are out there and what's being used. I would say the converged network topology is probably the most used in the industry. And what I mean by that is that converged topology also includes the business aspects of what's going on on that network. So you have one firewall, that firewall then goes to your BAS system and then also serves the business aspects of what's going on on that network. Not a, not a good plan because once they get past that firewall or they tie into those core switches, they've got access to your entire company. So here's just a real quick example of the pros and cons here. Minimize CapEx, we love that. Um, we love to minimize CapEx, but what, at what price? Increase cybersecurity and vulnerability um, and, and the networks are kind of tied together. Let's look at how we can separate those networks. So here's the segregated network topology, which is something we should be moving towards. Your business aspect is off to the side, production's kind of off to the side, and then you've got your facilities network down below. So you have two separate firewalls serving that, and, and that brings about a lot, of, a lot of benefits. There are some cons, of course. Um, increased CapEx. Uh, don't love that, but sometimes you have to spend a little bit more money to make sure that your systems are a little bit more reliable and less vulnerable to cyber, to cyber attacks. These will be in the presentation. We can read through those uh, as we move forward. 
The last example is the wireless topology. So this is starting to be used more and more. Have not quite seen this in practice in the field yet. We're getting there. Um, it seems to be the way of the future. And it, the reason is because you can really add devices as necessary without a lot of wiring and cabling. So, so there's a lot of benefits here with this application. Um, first, lower CapEx, great, we love that. And then quick deployments, getting things going and up and running pretty quick using IP addresses. The only other problem that we start to inch into again is that increased cybersecurity vulnerability. Whenever you have wireless devices out there, your cybersecurity vulnerability is increased. Um, but we're working hard, and I know the controls contractors in the industries are working hard to mitigate that and um, make sure you're selecting the right people to do the right job. All right. Well, thank you. That was a ton of information, Jason and Mike. Uh, that's a lot of information to take in. <laughs> So as a reminder, you can earn one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, and you do need to pass a 10 question exam. To take that exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab at the top of your screen. And that exam does open in a new browser window, so make sure you open it now so you can take the exam when we're all done here. All right, well, gentlemen, let's take some questions. Please type your question into the ask a question box and type the presenter's name before your question so that I know who should answer it. We'll get to as many questions verbally as we can. And questions that we don't get to will be posted online with the answers at www.csemag.com. To download those presentation slides, uh, both Mike and Jason have referred to a lot of information here. You can use the event resources on the left side of your screen. All right, gentlemen, uh, Mike, I'm gonna give you this first question here. Uh, please talk about PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers, and how those fit into HVAC systems. Yeah, great. Um... PLCs, so, you know, a long time ago, PLCs were kind of the ladder logic of the controls industry um, electronically, but they've really grown in, uh, over time and they, they act more like a DDC system or DCS system or BAS system. We went over all those. But the differences are PLCs are controllers that have a lot quicker and faster scan rates. So if you have a process in the field that you want to make sure is going right in the process industry or pharma industry or power industry for that matter, um, PLCs are found there quite often. And that's because they're, they're very redundant as far as CPUs go. They're redundant as far as power supplies go, not that, not that the BAS contractors are not caught up to that. It's just a little bit more um, modular in the industry. Um, and the, the, the one thing that I think they are starting to catch up to, but not quite there yet, is those scan times on the PLC, PLCs. They're just very fast controllers for automated um, processes, not similar to what we, we do here as far as creature comfort um, and, and some other things. Those are kind of the main differences that I see, Amara. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Jason, I'm going to give this next question to you. And I know you talked about this a little bit, but if you could dive a little bit deeper, how do building automation systems help with energy efficiency in a building? Well, a building automation system, at least if we keep using the HVAC system example that I referenced a number of times, is going to directly affect the energy use in the building. So that automation system might be what makes sure that system turns off or that system modulates to lower speeds when possible. Uh, we all need to remember that uh, while there's a lot of focus on first cost of a building, the construction of that actual building, the operations and energy consumption of that building is a lot more than whatever that initial cost was. Um, that's a cost that somebody has to live with for 40, 50, 60 year, years down the road or more. Um, so making sure that that building automation system has the appropriate sequences, has the appropriate control capabilities um, related to whatever the parts and pieces are, how VFDs are controlled, how uh, 
fans are controlled, how pumps are controlled, um, and in scheduling of those things and how they interlock with each other, interact with each other are, are really important points to make sure we hit on when you're writing a control sequence and the overall building automation system. Okay, good to know, thank you. Uh, let's see, Mike, another question for you. Does a building management system, a BMS, perform control function in addition to monitoring? Absolutely. Um, the BMS does have a GUI or a control function in addition to monitoring. Um, you know, the, the controls industry is a very fluid industry. Keeping up with the acronyms is going to be a struggle, but we, we are trying to do our best as far as from a design approach. Um, so, so building management system or monitoring system or, or whatever you would like to call it, um, it keeps changing per the vendor, maybe the controls contractor. But a lot of times, yes, from what we've seen, it does have a automation component to it. Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, Jason, I'm gonna send this next question to you. What information about the BAS, the building automation system itself, is key to include in the design documents? All right, so, what do we need to include? Things that need to be included are the functionality of the system. Uh, make sure that the sequences are clearly identified so that, um, th that the control contractor understands what's required. So those are the sequences, whether they're written in an outline format, a uh, points list. Um, a points list is a great way to make sure that every bit and piece is covered. Um, and uh, the open versus closed um, proprietary type systems to make sure that there's more than one car dealer that can work on your vehicle um, or auto repair shop that can work on your vehicle. That's a very important thing. That's going to be a, a long term uh, potential issue. Um, and then getting into things related to uh, some of the other things I had on one of my slides, monitoring, uh, trending capabilities. Uh, how, I ran into this on a recent project. How much data storage do I want from the trending information on the um, in the system? Is seven days okay? I don't know. I'm an engineer. More information is better. So give me more. I'll decide what I don't want uh, kind of thing. So making sure that we're identifying how long, how often trending occurs on systems and equipment. All that adds cost or it, it can affect cost, I should say. So making sure that people go into that with their eyes wide open, make sure that the owner understands if they're asking for, they wanna save every uh, bit of control data forever, uh, there's a cost associated with it. Uh, sometimes in bigger systems, that's, that's, a, that's something that can be accomplished. So uh, those are at least a few of the things that uh, I consider when I'm writing a uh, specification for an automation system. Sure, so really it depends. Got it. Of course. <laughs> All right. Um, Mike, this next question is for you, and this is an alphabet soup question. Do you prefer DIDO or BIBO designation for on off inputs or commands? Mike, you'll want to turn your microphone on to make sure that we can hear your response here. My apologies there. A lot of windows. Um, so it, it, it's it's not a big differentiation there between DI and DO or BI and BO. But for me, um, I, I prefer digital input and output versus binary input and output um, just because the, the process industry, the power industry, other industries are, are already using that nomenclature and it just seems like the right approach for us to continue to sort of follow that that foot that path thank you all right thank you uh, if you do have a question for one of our presenters today please type your question into the ask a question box and type their name before your question so that i know who should verbally address that questions that we don't get to today will be answered in writing Alrighty. Jason, next question goes to you. Please explain the value and best practices in specifying capabilities of a BAS for future needs and applications of the building and its end users. I can repeat any part of that if you'd like. I 
think I have it. Um, so I did uh, address a little bit of this in, uh, in I think the previous answer. So as far as future, future needs and applications in a building. So I, one of the references that I made during the presentation is sometimes everything uh, you think a building needs or an owner wants may not be affordable on day one. So setting up a system where additional pieces can be added. So I worked on a project recently where uh, there was a plethora of uh, systems that we wanted to integrate together into a single large building automation system. And slowly things got picked off one by one um, as, we, uh, as we went through some costing exercises and things like that. But we what we wanted to include and we kept in there is um, requirements for capabilities for the system to be modified later. So whether that modification was by the installing contractor, the vendor, or the manufacturer that sold the system, or as the uh, building operator gained experience and capabilities, uh, we wanna make sure that they, they have an opportunity to, uh, to modify the system in the future, add things to it without blowing it up. So nobody wants to hear, well, you've done these things and now you need a server. You didn't need it before. That's an expensive thing. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that should be considered um, as you go through and don't lose sight of, um, of the, you know, the, the dreams on the project as you write your BAS specification. There's, there's no reason that things can't be included or referenced or stated that this is a requirement that it needs to be added at a later date. Good point. Thank you. All right, uh, Mike, this goes back to kind of the beginning of your portion of the presentation. What is the cloud icon between the server and the switch? Yeah, that was just a symbol that designated the cloud, uh, the internet was really all it was. So it's, it's, the controls are actually leading up into the cloud and then there's a server level up there that's able to then send this out to remote uh, laptops or desktops or wherever you wanna view the, the control system or GUI. That's what it was. All right. Uh, next question, Jason. Um, talking a little bit about measurement and verification. How do you deal with M and V on a project, and what level of detail do you want to see in a building automation system? Uh, well, that's uh, that's a great question uh, to ask and to have some discussion on. So M and V uh, measurement and verification is not common on all projects. Uh, so all people probably don't have experience with that. Um, it could be used for a variety of reasons, whether it's related to uh, lead uh, on a project, uh, straightforward owner project requirements um, or some other reason. But it's important that as those things are identified that they are documented in the control system uh, specifications. If you don't say it, you're not getting it. Um, people do not throw things in for free on a project. Um, so if nothing else, at least writing in the um, uh, in the in a narrative form in the control specifications, you know the general understanding of what it needs to accomplish. Maybe some of the specifics aren't can't be added at that time because maybe things are still evolving, especially when um, projects go out in multiple bid phases or packages are released at different times, it's hard to have things uh, complete in some early packages. Um, but making sure that those things are stated, if you don't say it, you're not gonna get it. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and Mike, so this question, this will probably be our last question, and this kind of follows the same line of thought. Again, we're talking about trending, measurement, and verification. How do you handle a request to provide that trending in intervals, say, of minutes, or to maintain storage capability of those trends? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, because we do see a lot of this out in the industry where we are bogging down the network with um, too many packets and too much information trying to come back from a trending perspective. So you have to be you have to be thoughtful about what you are looking to find out on various pieces of equipment or how things are running, um, and make sure that you have the bandwidth uh, appropriate to be able to diagnose and find out that equipment. So today we're seeing a lot more a lot larger servers are being able to collect more and more data. 
The problem is the networks aren't growing quite as fast. Um, I, uh, I've been in situations with, um, uh, in the field where we've seen, you know, trends just not coming through because the packets are kind of bogging down that network. So again, you know, I think the approach today is we, we certainly want all the data today, but we also have to be thoughtful about what that data is and why we're going after it and be thoughtful about what those intervals are because unfortunately our networks just can't keep up with all that we're wanting to capture. So I would say just keeping in mind um, from your design perspective, what you're looking for and working with your owner to find out what he's trying to accomplish with those, with those trends. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, you. Thank you. And I'd like to wrap up by thanking these extraordinary subject matter experts. Mike Click and Jason Gerke for sharing their extensive knowledge of HVAC control systems. I'd also like to thank ABB for supporting this education session. And before you go, we need your feedback to improve future education sessions. A couple of questions will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a few seconds to complete it. Finally, on behalf of Consulting, Specifying, Engineer, and CFE Media and Technology, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time.